friend has got a lot to share. It's another edition of Radio Friends again. I'm Jim Harrington, and we're joined by a whole bunch of people. Dave Overson, Bob Craig from WDRC. Uh, we got John Landry, Bob Marks. Remember Bob Marks? I know his real name, but I'm not going to tell. Steve Parker and, of course, myself. Uh, today, we're going to focus on Bob Craig and his career. Bob, this tell us a little bit of something part. about what you've been doing for the last 50 years. <laughs> It'll be one of the shortest podcasts <laughs> in the radio. <laughs> uh, all right, where do I begin? So listen, starting on January 1st, 2023, I will be beginning my 60th year in broadcast. Are you serious? Wow. wow. 60 wow. years. Well, actually, it was maybe the late 50s when I was hanging around radio stations mm -hmm. and spinning records for... Uh, some people on radio, but actually it was 63 when I began at WBG in Boston as a studio engineer. Jim Harrington, you know those Browns yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. You were well, probably, did, were, you, I, were you spinning the uh, turntables for uh, Arnie Woo Woo Ginsburg up there? No, he was, a, he was at WMAX. Yeah, that's true, but yeah. At WBZ at that time, because of the union deal with Westinghouse, and I don't know if it's still like that when you were there, but the engineer... And this is for the radio historian. At the time, WBZ, which was a very strict union station, we as studio engineers only got to use the mic switch. DJ spun the records and played the uh, cart machines. But uh, they had also a very interesting set of the news people. Westinghouse at the time had a news network. And actually, it had a network of uh, programming, too. But the news feeds from Westinghouse, which would be on a national level, were to be recorded onto acetate. And you had to run those things off of acetate and not put them on tape. And it was a very delicate operation to record onto acetate. If any of you have ever done anything like that, you know the styluses were very delicate. I wound up breaking one. <laughs> how delicate that, are, that they were. But uh, anyhow, uh, the engineer would run uh, actualities off of the Ampex reel-to-reel -reel that were local. It was rather complex, but it was a lot of fun. So anyhow, as a kid of 19, this was a great job. And it was my entree into radio, uh, actually being paid for it at a union rate, mm -hmm. which was more than my dad was making <laughs> at the time. <laughs> So it was really a lot of fun, and it actually, there's a, a, a very lengthy backstory that goes to that. But if we had time, I would tell it maybe at another time. They had made some concessions, Bob, by the time I got there. Uh, they still ran the master control board. I mean, we were in a sub-studio, the d disc jockey, but we could open our own mic and cue up our own records and, you know, fire the records. I mean, we did the whole show in, in the studio by ourselves, but everything went into the master control, and then they had the power to ride levels, and uh, they ran the delays for the talk shows and things like that. So they had changed a little bit, but they still were. Yeah, I guess uh, the union lost the mics, which I think that was one of the remaining. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, there was a radio station in Boston, WNAC, which was owned by RKO in general. Mm -hmm. And it was another one of those... Uh, stations that was owned by a huge corporation as not to be confused with the Hughes corporation of rock my boat fame but a huge corporation <laughs> and chicago is a very um big union city as well but wnac in boston actually employed a record so the engineer ran the technicalities and the record spinner spun the records for the djs and i applied for a job there Oh, I guess I was in high school as a record spinner. I never got the job. I think it paid something like $50 a week. But that just showed you how some of the throwbacks to the old radio days of the 1940s held on to major market radio stations that were owned by big corporations. For some reason, they didn't want to lose that professionalism. And so, you know, in this day and age, it the only time you'll see uh, like a combo set up is Primarily with a talk, with a talk uh, uh, format. For those days of uh, people spinning records for the the engineers spinning records, or playing the cards for the uh, DJs, 
is pretty much long gone. Uh, I think we have Bob Marks. He wants to make a comment uh, about Bob Craig's remarks. Yeah, yes, I do. See, we are people of a certain age. Uh, we're also radio uh, people who kind of understand the uh, the terminologies that we're tossing around here, uh, Bob Craig. Uh, but using uh, terminologies like uh, carts, cart machines, <laughs> it has no meaning to a lot of the younger <laughs> folks listening in. Uh, so uh, acetate, uh, that's another thing. Um, what else? Actualities. You know, what the heck is an actuality? What are you doing in the studio using all of these things? And uh, how does it tie in with what's coming over the radio uh, airwaves? Well, you know, that was one of the mystifying things to me as a kid when I was about five or six years old. This, <clears throat> this um, fascination with hearing music and voices coming out of this box, this table radio, that, you know, was maybe about a foot long and about seven or eight inches high. And I looked in the back of the radio, trying to see if I could see anything or anybody. And it was just fascinated me how this was able to happen. Because we all had record players back in the day. We were able to play records, but that's as far as it went. It went to your own ears from your house. How was this able to come from someplace else, off in a distance? And it, it had held fascination with me for years until the first time that I visited a radio station in 1955 and walked in there and saw this massive display of records, these huge turntables that, you know, were ground level and probably about 36 inches high. And there would be about four or five of them there and a microphone. So this is how it's done. This, you know, just captivated me. And Man, as soon as I saw that, I said, definitely, this this is for me. This is something that just boggles the mind. Jim? Bob, I got a question for you. You've been in the business, you said, 60 years almost. Are you celebrating your 60th year? So you've gone from what you said, the uh, acetate records and the big turntables. Now you're probably working with computerized setups and a whole different uh, environment. Do you think it's an improvement today, or do you do you miss that hands-on that we all experienced back in the 70s and the 80s, you know? That's one of those questions, I guess, that gets a yes and a no. You know, from the yes side, I miss that movement that you had about in putting records on turntables and putting things in the machine and being very active. On the other hand, uh, I'm assuming that most of the people listening have uh, uh, compact discs or CDs, and you know how convenient it is. Simply stick that into a machine and select the track that you're going to play. Uh, the carts or cartridges that we used to hear a lot of the music from singularly had a recording on it, so you would record the record onto a cartridge, stick it into the machine, and play it. That was the next step to convenience. Now, the ultimate inconvenience in doing a DJ show today is having stuff that's already computerized, where you just call up numbers or key in numbers, and there they are, and there's a whole list of them that you pick and choose from. To me, that's not really radio. Thankfully, what I do today at WRTI in Philadelphia, which is a jazz and classical station, it's owned and run by Temple University, we have access to everything that we want. We have access to wide orbit, which is digitization, the computerization of the music, which is not fully installed yet. We still have turntables, which are state of the art. We still have, we don't have cart machines, however. We have reel to reel machine that does not work, unfortunately. <laughs> and we have two cassette machines which don't work. So it's either playing records, or, uh, uh, CDs, or play an actual uh, record. But I, I love that, that physicality, I'll call it, but being able to you know, have those things physically available to you to play. Plus, when you're playing music off the, uh, off the computer, you don't have the liner notes from the CDs or from the albums. And with a radio station like ours, which really depends a lot on information, about what you're playing, whether it's classical or jazz music, really why people listen to stations that play a form of music that they can't get on a hundred other stations off the 
style. So if you're hosting a radio program, whether it's jazz or classic, you better know what the hell you're talking about because the phone will light up very fast and emails will come. This is Bob Marks here. Uh, I just want to weigh in with this. I think the difference between uh, the old days, the old ways, and the new ways with computerization, I liken it to driving a sports car with a stick or driving it with an automatic yeah. with a stick. Mm -hmm. You, you kind of have to, you hug the road, you kind of know what you're doing and, and you're concentrating all the time on uh, shifting gears. With an automatic, you sit back, relax and just drive. I think it's a lot more fun, you know, with a stick uh, driving a car. So uh, I'm making that comparison with the old ways and the new ways. But I gotta say, editing, as you go along, oh, is so yeah. much better with Unbelievable. the screen than the old ways. And you could describe the old way of editing. Real to real. Yeah, the old ways uh, editing from reel to reel is the you would put the the tape onto, actually, Dave Overton should actually explain this because he's an engineer. <laughs> Dave, explain this better than I could. Well, with, <clears throat> with tape, we had to obviously reel to reel. But any editing we had to make, we had to queue up to the beginning of the first word that we wanted to take out, and we would use a grease pencil uh, and mark the playback head because there were three heads on the machines, but we used the playback head and then go back to the end of the sentence that you're taking out and the last words and then grease get the grease pencil on that. Then put the tape in a, what we call an edit block and we would cut it on an angle and then go back, actually spool back the tape till we come back to the first mark we made, cut it and take the tape and put it together and then take some uh, spicing tape, uh, audio spicing tape, which was a quarter inch thick and or uh, in, in length and cut it and lay it right in there and press it. And if you did a good job, it was seamless. And you would leave breaths in there. You, you know, your hearing had to be ex had to be exquisite because you're you're listening for little clicks, little pops, uh, the person taking a breath. There's a whole technique to that. And uh, but you know, <laughs> engaging, but um, that's why yeah, engineers that's put in for overtime a lot, <laughs> yeah. And half my overtime was because of the outtakes I used to put, yeah. You're 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 putting that stuff in there, so uh, that's basically it. Anybody else, yeah? I just learned a lot. Is that how you do it? <laughs> yeah, that is it. That is it. God, for well, 50 years, with, I've been screwing with, it with up. New no. technology today, with the new technology, the concept is still the same. You're placing a mark at the beginning of your edit and you're going to the end of the sentence you're taking out, place another mark, and then you just hit ripple delete, and that automatically puts the two pieces together automatically. So you're not using any. Any tape, you're not using uh, any razor blades uh, and cutting yourself or using any grease pencils uh, to make those marks. And plus, you can enlarge the wave because you're looking at a wave in the software you're working with and you can enlarge that. So now you can even make tighter edits than you were able to do before, even with a razor blade. So, and plus, uh, if you make a mistake, you can undelete. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you just done delete and do it again. Yeah, that that was the best part, I think, with the new technology. Absolutely, yeah. I agree. Oh, the yeah. old technology, yeah. of, mm. you know, because you're taking out a little, you know, just a taking out a letter S or something on on a word, and you're you know, and you try to hopefully you catch it just right when you're using the uh, uh, razor blade uh, uh, way of doing it and making sure you're cueing is right there and if you just move a half, just a fraction you get a clip in there then you got to try and cut that out or sometimes if you cut out too much and you got to put it back back together that's a pain because now you're looking at little minute pieces of tape in here uh, i don't even want to <laughs> get into that but with new technology today you can go right up but you can enlarge that s sound and you get right up to the to the point where the person is just about to speak, make your mark there and and your two marks and then hit a ripple delete, which puts it automatically together. If it isn't the same, just hit edit, undo and do it again. This is Jim Harrington. Um, the automated systems, though, the voice tracking and stuff like that, I've never heard a system yet that can do 
a, a radio program as well as it was done back when we were doing it live. I mean, they do a good job, but I, I've never heard the uh, talk-ups being as precise. I've never heard the music being selected properly. I mean, they have Music Maker and mu- all these different uh, programs that supposedly pick the music based upon the f- way you want it picked if you're programming the station, but I don't think I've ever heard it done the way a human being does it yet. Now, they're getting maybe they're getting closer. Maybe the day will come. And they have some very sophisticated systems, the Prophet and Scott systems and all these different systems out there. But am I the only one that believes that? Or are there anyone else here who? Uh, uh, Steve Parker here. Um, the, I think that the thing is with all the automation, we've lost the spontaneity. We've, yeah. lost, we've lost the mistakes. We've lost when somebody is live and they got to find out what the heck when everything goes wrong and how they dig out of it. It's the difference between doing live theater and doing a movie where you take it over 27 different times do that take again. And when you're live, whether it's live radio or live television or anything, that's the most exciting to me because you're tap dancing over a, or over a pit of a burning fire. I mean, because how do you get out? And I think I had mentioned before um, when I was uh, working on the other side, on the dark side of the business and, and putting buys down around the country, it was the first time I ever heard, you know, the term recorded to sound live. And I had to say, I said, well, he's in the studio, right? Yeah. So how come he can't read it live? Oh, no, it's recorded to sound live. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, this way, um, if he makes a mistake or something else, he can clean it all up and it'll really sound good. I go, yeah, but half the, half the interest is when it goes wrong. And I think we've lost that. This is Jim Harrington. To that point, when I was at DRC, when your dad hired me, I didn't realize I needed glasses. And I had a problem with live copy. I was terrible with live copy to a point where I started to learn how to ad lib. I knew what they wanted to say. And if my eyes didn't catch the copy the right way and I got lost a little bit, I just make up new copy and make it sound like it was real. It made me sound better. And I learned how to do something. And also I learned when I was at DRC that I had stigmatisms and I needed glasses. And as soon as I got glasses, uh, that changed, but I, you know, live doing things live uh, with the mic open. Sometimes it makes you a better jock, you know. Absolutely, I agree with that wholeheartedly, Joe. Yeah. As long as we're on the subject of perfection and broadcasting, things quickly come to mind. Last Sunday, our Phillies won the National League pennant, so. Uh, sorry about that, Jim, in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so got, Pittsburgh won't see one for a while. Well, you never can tell. But anyhow, I was watching the news, and it was around 6.15 on Sunday evening, and the newscaster said, we're going down to such and such a bar where so-and-so is with a group of Philadelphia fans, and this is before, this was apparently in the final moments of the game. So she's giving the report, and she said, thank you, we're here giving the, uh, we're here surrounded by a bunch of Philly fans who can't wait to see what the outcome, and all of a sudden, this huge eruption from the bar happens, and that was it. The Phillies won the pennant. So she's running around with a microphone, and all these people are half loaded, you know, who are just so jubilant, they're running around, and some guy comes up with a microphone, we fucking did it! <laughs> <laughs> Live TV, it was beautiful. <laughs> and another thing that I, I, I really miss, you know, talking about things like spontaneity. When was the last time you heard somebody crack up on the air? You That's know, true. You don't hear that. <laughs> That's anymore. true. That's exactly the point I was going to make before when you were talking about it, uh, Dave Oberson. <laughs> this is Bob Marks doing the morning show uh, with a co-host. Uh, when I was at Christian FM uh, for all those years, uh, we would sometimes start talking about something, and one of us would say something that would strike a funny bone in, in both of us. One of them would start laughing. The other one would pick up and start laughing, and it was on the air live, and sometimes we couldn't even catch our breath. We were laughing so hard. There would have been dead air except for the fact that we're laughing. I mean, right. we lose that today. <laughs> you know, there's some people that have phenomenal, phenomenal uh, strength. Uh, Lon Landis, one of our newsmen at DRC, 
had tremendous composure. I mean, you could not crack him up. And I, he would be my newsman in the midday. And I would try and crack him up when I knew I didn't have to do a live spot in his newscast. Because if I had a live spot, I know I would go to pieces. One day I said, I'll, I'm going to get you. And we, for some strange reason, which is unexplained, and I'm sure those of you who are on the Zoom uh, who worked at the radio station would understand this, but we had actually access to a dildo at the station. And I walked into the news booth when he was delivering it. And he was reading the story and I handed him the dildo. <laughs> and he did not crack up. I couldn't believe it. He started waving the damn thing around. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, this guy is impossible to break up. Another, uh, there was a, there is a video, it's on YouTube, of Dan Ingram at WCBS FM in New York. And his newsman is sitting right next to him and he's delivering a newscast. And Ingram is like one foot away from him, looking him straight in the face, making all kinds of faces and hand gestures. And the guy, did not crack up. I believe that. You yeah. know, Jim Harrington here. C conversely, I remember once, do you remember Lee Roberts? Yeah. Bob, Lee Bob, oh, Bob yeah. Cohen. Yes. But Lee was one of these guys who, by the way, if you knew him in person, he sounded so calm. And, and then when he got on the mic, it was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He went in the voice. He had the voice of God, you know. Right. <laughs> he was, was like, it oh, was but, but on a Sunday morning, I'm in Boston and I'm listening in my car, and I was a kid. I was like 19 or 20 years old, and <laughs> and he's doing the news on WRKO, very formatted back then when it was, you know, the Drake format. Yeah, this is WRKO yeah. 2020 yeah. news, and he hit – somebody must have either done something or he hit something that struck him funny, and it happened at the, be at the beginning of the of the newscast, and he, and he laughed all the way through it. I mean, he tried to get his composure, but he just couldn't do it. So if it was like a three-minute newscast, it was three minutes of laughter followed by, this is Bob, this is Lee Roberts, 2020 <laughs> News. <laughs> you know, there was a tape of that around, and Ed Bruder has it. Oh, it's oh, funny stuff. Oh. That would be something that we could try and uh, get a hold of and put into one of our podcasts. I heard it live. You know who else and was like that? Uh, Robert Michael Walker. I, I worked with him as a newsman doing 2020 News in 1970. At, uh, this is at, at POP. And uh, off the air, he sounded, you know, pretty meek, pretty average. Yeah. Uh, he gets on the air, and uh, man, all of a sudden, this is Robert Michael Walker. <laughs> 2020 News. And I said, is this the same guy? <laughs> yeah, this is um, Steve Steve Parker real quick over here. There was a guy that I used to work with that we all remember. His name was Rob Branham. And um, and Rob, Rob and I used to do some volunteer um, uh, reading uh, for blind and print handicap. And it was really interesting because he um, he was across the hallway from me and he could never break up. If we had something, if children had been set on fire in a daycare, Rob would be, you know, walk across the hallway and just do anything. The most serious gut wrenching story. And he would make the most ridiculous moves trying to break me up. Well, uh, one day he was in the middle of something and I walked into his studio. You can never get Rob. And he looked at me and I just I took off my tie my shirt I just, <laughs> all the way down to just my drawers and I'm standing there and he just looks at me and never even bats an eye and goes back to you Steve <laughs> I'm in tears now I'm cracking up I run across to it in my studio and he took all of my clothes ran outdoors <laughs> threw them up all over the parking lot <laughs> but, but never, never ever ever you guys me. remember when uh, when uh, Bill St. James uh, 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 was he Billy Hart on yeah, DRC yeah. when he took the helium in the balloon? Yeah, and and I Bill had there. and Bill had this big voice. You know, big, Bill yeah. he's he's one of the most successful, I guess, freelance announcers in the country. Even today, he does stuff. I think for NBC, but he would, he spent the whole show inhaling helium. <sighs> Hi there, boys and girls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you would never hear that on a, a voice track. Uh, no, no. 
Yeah. Well, when, when Dave and I, I mean, first of all, one of the most contagious thing is like, you know, we all know a, 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 one of the great guys that we used to have at DRC went on to a huge career uh, up in Buffalo and all different parts of the country, Sandy Beach. Mm-hmm. And when Sandy broke up one time so huge at uh, DRC that we still have that laugh somewhere. And it's so contagious when you hear him laugh because he's on the air and he, he breaks up and he can't get his composure back. But that's contagious. And with um, and, and still to this day, he must have carried it with him uh, just the way he would break up on the air. How many times he broke up after that, we don't know. But some of his listeners will say, oh, we used to love when, when you would laugh on the radio. But with Overson and I, we were um, we were uh, he was he was my sidekick, as it were. Sometimes I think I was his sidekick and we would be on the air. And, and Dave, um, if Dave's mind and mine and, and so many of us had that similar other track running every now and then <laughs> and if there was a, a way to something could be construed more than one way or something they would be over there and just start laughing hysterically and i more than once i had a while the mic was open i had to just point at him as i'm furious and point at him and then point at the door and throw him right out of the studio because i was <laughs> doing talk i had to keep it straight and one time dave went out and he totally fell down as he left the studio onto the floor but uh, yeah, it's, it doesn't take much when you have that other person. But I do find newsmen are so good and s- most of them are so twisted that they, that they have a great sense of humor, but they play it dry so well. Oh, I know. You know, Dave had a very contagious laugh. I remember doing a contest with somebody on the air. I think it was one of those contests at DRC where we would ask people to Talk on a given subject for thirty seconds without saying or, oh, yeah, or ah, yeah, uh, and so it was up to the DJ conversation, to come up please, with the with the with, with, with the word, and I asked uh, this contestant, "Plus in thirty seconds, everything you know about Kill Bassa." They breaks up, and <laughs> I could hear the laughter through the glass. So I invariably so easy to crack up cracked up as well and this person went on to do it i think that she got through it in 30 seconds oh we're all i'd like to ask bob craig a question Uh, you've been on the air a lot of years can you think of uh some of the things you might have said on the air live that you regretted saying because you didn't realize you were saying it but it came out anyway Mm. but you thought about it or somebody said hey did you know you said this (laughs) anything like that come to mind I I can't think of anything off the top of my head like that. There's not much up there anyhow to begin with. <laughs> um, well, did you ever yeah. you were you were famous, uh, Bob, for your lunches and you always every every time it was lunchtime you'd have to come up with the most god awful uh, scene for lunch and you I don't know where how did you ever come up with these sandwiches or the grossest things in the give give our podcast listeners an example of what one of your lunches would be. And then the, the, the follow-up to that is, did you come up with them spontaneous off the top of your head or where did they come from? And were there ever some some lunches you went, oh man, I went too far on that one? No, I never regretted doing any of those because they were so nauseating to begin with. But to give people a little backstory on that, they uh, these were concoctions that I did it at lunchtime every day, and it got to the point where I just did it one day, uh, actually at another radio station in Norwich, Connecticut, just to fill time. I guess we needed a half a minute to sort of go before the news, and I just thought of doing something like this. But anyhow, every day at noontime on DRC, right before the news, I would concoct something like um, a chocolate-covered avocado sandwich with strawberries and sliced bananas <laughs> on white bread because it's lunchtime. <laughs> and then the news <laughs> sound would come so in. Then, was that always out, was it always off the top of your head when you made those, or did you think about them in advance? No, I, just I, you know, I could do them spont- uh, spontaneously right now. You know, you just. Maybe if that's the way your mind works. Bob, why they never have a, like a, a cookbook for you know Bob Craig's lunchtime cookbook? Oh. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> I would have been probably sued for <laughs> ptomaine poisoning or something. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, there was a character, a cartoon that somebody did. As a matter of fact, I have it 
uh, in my office. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Okay. Me... <laughs> okay, just talk Bob. among yourselves. As Bob slowly crawls over to the picture. There it is here. Some, I, I don't know who did this, but somebody actually drew this. And I have the DRC microphone. Uh, let me see if I can bring this in real oh, quick. Wow. Yeah. I love it. And there it is. And there, there are the, the DRC call letters. <laughs> oh, my God. Look at the fish Sardines. In the sandwich. Oh, God. <laughs> And peanut Sorry. butter. Oh, my that God. is funny. <laughs> chocolate syrup. <laughs> syrup. <laughs> that's how that's how popular that item was. It I mean, was. Yeah. Go on. You were coming up to the top of the hour at noontime. Right. That's when you did it. That's, that's right. And you know when we would go out and do remotes or whatever, I would get mothers that would come up to me and say, "You know, that's the only way we can get our kids to eat lunch." <laughs> You're the man on the radio. <laughs> Don Lantry has a question. I don't have a question. I just want to make a comment about uh, when you and I, uh, uh, I used to uh, engineer your show and I used to take all of your inch lunch times and put them on a tape. And I think we had oh. something like about an hour and a half's worth of you with your menu. It was really, it I didn't was, know that you used to play them at parties and whatnot. Really? I had not. Yeah, you still have that? Do still I have don't that? think so. No. Oh, Oh, that'd be uh, precious. Yeah, I mean, it was oh. like an hour and a half worth of Bob Jeez. saying, and it was, and and I cut it so that uh, it was an, a huge, huge uh, menu, and then at the end it was, <laughs> it's lunch. Oh, <laughs> John, shame you shouldn't have shouldn't have gotten rid of that. <laughs> that belongs yeah. to the Hall of Fame. That Hall of Shame. <laughs> oh, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, hey guys, I, how long? Also, you know, also I also miss hearing on the air of cue birds. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to explain to people, you when we would play forty-five RPM recordings, a number of companies put them or recorded them, pressed them on plastic, and plastic when you cue a record up is kind of like, well, you see turntablists do it in clubs, jocks, DJs do it in clubs. They keep rotating back and forth of recording and we would scratchy. have it just and it became all scratchy well the plastic recordings were the worst they would you know cue burns you'd go through them like after three or four cues <laughs> they would uh, have this staticky sound at the open and just hearing that on the air you just don't hear that anymore oh, well, how about that, even how about even like a scratch in a record oh yeah, yeah. pops and clicks yeah you know yeah. it got so that when vinyl became so poorly pressed back in the 70s with the advent of CDs coming out, those pops and clicks were actually built into the vinyl because <laughs> the vinyl was so cheap that they used. Yeah. And RCA was really one who was terrible at that. Yeah, there, were, yeah. there were some companies who actually were known for bad presses, weren't there? Oh, it was Arista. terrible. On AM radio, nobody would hear them. Anyhow. That's true. Right. right. Well, guys, I think we've uh, we talked about doing a kind of a shorter podcast. Uh, <laughs> nice job, nice uh, let's see, Steve Parker, Bob Marks, John Landry, Dave Overson, and the great lunchtime Whoa. man Bob Craig. My Thank gosh, you guys! Hey, Bob, sixty years! Congratulations, my friend. Yeah. That, that's yeah. terrific. Thank you. Good for <laughs> you. We'll see you guys uh, again next week. You a friend? You a friend? Has got a lot to share.